Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the May 11th edition of Crop Talk. And today's Crop Talk, we have uh, John Hurd on, our uh, crop specialist uh, nutrients from Manitoba Agriculture, and he's going to be talking about uh, reconsidering your fertilizer strategy. We're getting a lot of calls. Uh, producers are starting to get very concerned about all the water that's been hanging around. Also, uh, just the fact that uh, uh, some fertilizer still needs to be put on, and we're running against the clock. And so people are starting to think of different ways of getting their fertilizer on for this season. And then we're gonna go into our crop scouting panel. We've uh, been getting, again, more questions coming in regarding uh, wet conditions and uh, you know what we can do to uh, answer some of those problems that occur with wet conditions. So uh, we're having uh, a little bit of an issue with getting uh, John on first this morning. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna go into the crop scouting panel and uh, I got a few questions for the the producers to uh, to work on here this morning. So uh, I'm gonna just kind of skip through some of the questions and be bounce back and forth here. But the first one's gonna go out to uh, uh, Kim Brown. And uh, we got lots of producers talking about chemical shortages and should we be looking at adding uh, uh, different products. I put ammonium sulfate, but there's a several different products out there uh, to the tank to uh, one either uh, improve the efficiency of, of the chemical or or even look at maybe stretching it. So uh, Kim, uh, I'll let you take away that first question. Okay, so um, yeah, lots of talk about chemical shortages and you're right, there definitely are chemical shortages and they're also really expensive compared to the last uh, couple of years anyways. Um, we started seeing some price increases last year, but it's really jumped. So we know that, um, yeah, can we look at using ammonium sulfate or similar type products to stretch or increase the control of products? Well, adding something to the spray tank is great, but only if you need it. I am not a fan of putting in a lot of different adjuvants um, unless you absolutely know you need it. Uh, and, and I do have a little presentation here on water quality, which we can do now or we can do um, at the end of, the, of all the questions, if you like, that's up to you. Um, but I just do know there are a lot of products out there. So, sorry, do you want to do that? Let's we'll go to that right now and then I'll finish. You bet. Okay, okay, let me know when you can see my slides. We can see them. Okay, okay, so just using AMS with glyphosate and this is just some pretty standard stuff. I'm gonna talk specifically, I'm gonna talk about just some water quality issues and then we're gonna talk about glyphosate um, but, you know, going forward, uh, just in general, I think there are some issues with lots of products on the market now that you can put in the spray tank. And, and I do know anecdotally, a lot of farmers and a lot of retailers tell me they have great success using these products. Um, I think that's great. I personally haven't seen any testing done with them. And I know I, I'm, I'm really a fan of sticking to the label when products are registered, when herbicides are registered, you need to be um, sticking to the label and usually they're registered with a, an adjuvant at least that they're supposed to be with. And sometimes on labels, there are statements about using different uh, different adjuvants or different uh, other add-ins. I mean, not an adjuvant, but another add-in like ammonium sulfate, depending on water quality. And so we know there are certain instances where you really do need to use something like ammonium sulfate or it's your, your product is just not going to work. Um, having said that, I just think we need to use the other products with caution and uh, because usually they haven't been tested um, at, you know, at a, a trial level where, the, you know, things have been randomized and replicated in a proper trial. Uh, but again, we do hear there's a lot of anecdotal success with some of these products. And so again, I think it's, it's the same as, same as some of these uh, fertilizer products that we deal with. Uh, it's buyer beware. Um, you know, your the onus is on you uh, to make sure that these products are going to work. And I'd, I would be really, really careful with them, especially when we're in herbicide shortages and when we have uh, really high priced um, herbicides, the ones we can get are very high priced. So um, when we're talking about water quality effect on herbicide, there's some real basic things. There's cleanliness. Now this is a big deal too. We've had a lot of our overland uh, 
water sources, all of our dugouts and that type of thing are filled up. Not a lot of people fill from dugouts, but, uh, you know, depends on the area. It depends on your water source. But, you know, those have been dry in the last two or three years. Those are filled again now. So we do need to make sure that that is a clean water source. The, we don't want that. They talk about turbidity, which is basically suspended solids in there. Um, dirty water. If it's physically got dirt and particulate matter in the water, that's not good. We don't want to use that for any reason. Um, it'll clog filters and screens and things like that. But all also with a couple of products uh, like uh, glufosinate and, and with glyphosate, those products you, you do not want to spray with dirty water, uh, especially glyphosate. It just inactivates it. It doesn't work and we can't do that. Um, but more often we are talking about the mineral ions that are in water because there are loads of mineral ions in water. Most water sources are different. These can change from year to year. And particularly after we've been in a drought situation, we do see the water quality will change until it kind of stabilizes and we get back to a new normal, whatever that is. Uh, but again, we've come off a drought. We've come off very low uh, groundwater uh, amounts of groundwater. Uh, we're back, you know, where our groundwaters, we've been recharging, our wells are full, our, a, a lot of, you know, our surface waters are being uh, replenished type thing. So we do need to be aware that sometimes that water quality changes after a drought and we just need to be aware of what's there. So in the past, if you've never had an issue with water, that is great. If you've had great water, that's really great. Lucky you. But I really think that this is a year that we need to be testing um, to just double check that everything's fine. So because of these minerals that are in that suspend that are in the water, we know there's minerals in water. Um, it, there's different things that we look at. There's hardness and there's bicarbonates and there's things like iron and manganese. Now these can have a chemical effect on some of our herbicides, but they also can oxidize and form precipitates that can plug screens and nozzles. So there's like a physical issue with them as well, as well as the chemical issue. And that can't be corrected with any additives. So that is something that if you have really high iron and manganese levels, um, that can't be fixed. Some of the other issues, the hardness issues, that's an issue that you can fix with something like ammonium sulfate. Um, so when we talk about water hardness, we talk about hard water, it has high levels of calcium and magnesium, um, and that's usually reported as calcium carbonate or CaCO3 equivalent. And so there can be other ions present. And again, when we talk about all of the ions in water, there's other things like iron and potassium and nitrate. They're usually not significant. They do end up adding up but they're usually a very small proportion of the problem. The biggest problem ions are your calcium and magnesium. So those are like your problem children. If you have a big family, you know, everybody has those, <laughs> those, those ones, right? Um, and so calcium and magnesium, those are a positive charge and they affect herbicides that are weak acids like glyphosate and also the amine formulations of 2,4-D. So it's, it's a chemical reaction. They're positive charged, weak acids are negative charged. And so they actually bind and they make that, that herbicide molecule not available or less available, or it binds some of those molecules so that you've got less, less herbicide uh, working. Um, so hardness above 250 to 350 parts per million of CaCO3 equivalent should be treated. Um, and bicarbonate is another thing that gets tested and that's usually associated with sodium ions. If you have high sodium water, um, that can affect things like dim herbicides. So your clethodim, your, uh, which is like, you know, your, your Centurion, your Select, uh, I think your Arrow, that's another one of the brand names. Uh, there's multiple brand names of clethodim and things like uh, Cethoxidim, trococidim that's achieve and post and those type of things those and also again your amine formulations something like a 2,4-D amine so a bicarbonate uh, again associated usually with high sodium water uh, but again specifically affects your dim herbicides and your 2,4-D amine and basically above 500 parts per million may need treating but you, you you really have to watch that number with those particular herbicides so when you're testing your water Sometimes you'll get something called, or usually you'll get something called TDS, which is total dissolved solids. And basically it's adding up all of the ions, your calcium and magnesium. Again, those are your two big ones, but also your sodium, your sulfate, your chloride, your bicarbonate, it kind of adds everything up. And it's in a, your, your hard water is usually a direct proportion of the TDS because your calcium and magnesium are the biggest parts of your TDS. You'll also get your bicarbonate, which sometimes is reported as this HCO3 here. You'll get pH now, or you should get pH if you are testing your water. These are the things you should be looking for. Between six to eight is fine. Uh, some particular herbicides, particularly some of the insecticides, really do not do well with very high pH water. And But again, those will be on labels and you need to be aware of those. Um, sometimes it just affects the, the half-life of that chemistry and in, or the, the, the activity of that chemistry in the spray tank. So you need to spray very quickly. You don't want the chemistry, you don't want that to sit in the spray tank for very long. 
Um, sometimes they'll measure the salinity, which is an, usually EC or electrical conductivity, but the salinity of groundwater is usually, can usually substitute as a TDS. So if you're not getting TDS number, sometimes you get an EC number. And again, if your EC is less than 500, then there's probably no effect on the pesticides. So there's different numbers that you get off a, salt, off, off a water test, but they should be well explained. Um, now, in particular, the glyph glyphosate is one, one thing that we are really concerned about with hard water, and this is right off of their pesticide label, which is in our guide to pro crop protection on our product pages. Now, this is the glyphosate page on 260, part of the glyphosate pages. It all starts on, I think, page 252. Uh, there's quite a few pages here, but this is right towards the end, and it says effective growing conditions, but here where I've highlighted, it says hard water in quotes, or water containing calcium and magnesium or iron, again, they've included iron in this, it's usually just the calcium and magnesium, will reduce the activity of glyphosate products proportional to the level, hard, level of hardness. Um, reducing application water volume and or adding ammonium sulfate at 1.2 kg per acre, when that's using the 99% dry formulation, or 2.4 liters per acre, and that's using the 49% solution, will reduce the negative effects of low levels of hard water ions. If water is extremely hard, and this is then it's greater than 700 ppm or 40 grains, that's an, grains is an older number, you'll see that on some water tests, but not anymore, we're mostly talking ppm, but you may find some reference to grains. Um, and if you need, I can show you how to calculate that. But basically higher than 700 parts per million, uh, another water source should be found. And then again, this dirty water or water with suspended soil or organic matter will reduce control. Uh, so they actually on the glyphosate label and on our product pages, we actually have a statement. Um, so this is something that you need, again, you need to get that water test and you need to look at, um, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, under 350 or from 350 to 700, you should be treating that type of thing. So that's on the label. Now, then there's actually loads of studies done on this. This is uh, actually off the Washington State website and they actually have a good product here, the good paper here, and they have a calculator that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Um, ammonium sulfate as a water conditioner can improve glyphosate uh, efficacy. And basically they talk about uh, how ammonium sulfate, it reacts with the dissolved cations. So it forms insoluble sulfates that do not react with glyphosate. So you put the spray grade ammonium sulfate in the tank first and you thoroughly mix that in. So what that does is it absorbs all of those bad the cations like the um, the uh, the calcium and the magnesium and possibly some you know the iron as well although that number is usually quite a lot smaller um, and then you put the glyphosate in and the glyphosate doesn't bind so that's basically how it works you're just tying up those bad cations uh, so that the glyphosate doesn't bind to them and the glyphosate still works now here is a handy calculator. Now, this is a snip off their website, so I obviously can't link to that calculator right now, uh, but they do have that on their website, and I encourage you to use it. So it's using an equation developed at North Dakota State University. There was, North Dakota State has done a lot of work with water quality and adjuvants and all kinds of things, and this, this guy here, this Nalawea, uh, has done a ton of work, um, and so this calculator came based on their calculations, and uh, basically it tells you the amount of AMS required, and so uh, they've got some general statements that if you don't have a water test, you can kind of throw in some ammonium sulfate anyways, and it does tend to help uh, glyphosate uh, efficacy somewhat, um, and basically you can use either the liquid or the dry. So this is the statement, on, and again, this is a really good website, but this is what their calculator looks like. If you go to their website and you click on that link, you get this calculator here. You can type in your source and the date for your purposes, but you would put, you would get your lab results, your, your tests and your lab results, and you would put those numbers in here in this calculator, and it actually would tell you how much ammonium sulfate to use. So it does the math for you. And again, it's um, and it says here completely dissolve the AMS in a near full tank before adding herbicides because you want that AMS in that spray water to tie up all of the cations before you start adding the glyphosate because you don't want to neutralize that glyphosate. So. Water testing kits are available at our service centers. So all of our 10 service centers have the kits, they have the bottles, and they also have instructions for sampling, for storage, and for shipping. And uh, you know, you should be, there's different tests to choose from, but you know, you're, you're doing a test for, for herbicide, use spraying herbicides. So you would just pick that test. And unfortunately, we've got some downtime right now because of the weather, we're not able to get on our fields very quickly. Um, this is a good thing to do before spraying season. And it's quite, you know, quite a quick thing to do if you sample and get it shipped off right away, uh, you can have the results fairly quickly. And I think, you know, that would be a good thing to do when we do unfortunately have this downtime. So that's all I had on that question. And I guess we'll, uh, uh, we can let everybody else take over from there. Thanks, thanks Lionel. 
Uh, good, thanks, Kim. Uh, uh, Laurie, if you could hand the screen back over to me, and uh, I will uh, going to ask maybe one or two more questions as we're getting John ready to uh, to come on. Uh, I guess uh, the next question, uh, I think I'm going to give to Ann Kirk, uh, and, and uh, we've been getting a, a lot of spring moisture, and uh, we're seeing that fall rye and winter wheat. Uh, how much moisture can they handle as we're seeing a lot of uh, crop right now, uh, whether the entire field is underwater or the call I was getting was uh, a lot of the low spots are underwater and how many weeks uh, can they handle the water? Uh, in some cases they've been under for a couple of weeks and with the forecast that we have right now, um, should uh, they might be under for another week yet. So uh, uh, Anne, if you could uh, take a stab at that one. Sure. So uh, crop injury, you know, from the waterlogged conditions is due to that lack of oxygen. So um, when the soils are saturated, anything, you know, in the soil and any plant material that's under that high water line, um, you know, has very limited oxygen and the plants and any soil microorganisms use up what's, what's already there. Uh, so the biggest factor for how much crop injury you might see would be the temperature. So the higher the rate of temper temperature, or the higher the temperature, the more respiration that's happening, and then the faster that oxygen gets depleted. So it's, it's, it is tough to tell. So there have been, uh, what's generally thought is that, you know, since fall rye does take off and grow faster in the spring than winter wheat, it is, um, you know, has that higher rate of respiration. So we do see more, winter wheat is able, in general, better able to handle those waterlogged conditions than fall rye. Um, and we have had warm temperatures in the last week or so, so that's not, so any, you know, anything that's underwater with these, you know, temperatures in the high, in the 20s um, is obviously having more damage. So most uh, research and observations suggest that plants um, submerge for more than five to seven days when temperatures are greater than, say, 18 degrees Celsius uh, wouldn't make it, and that yield can be impacted by flooding by as little as 48 hours. That said though, so if temperatures are cooler, the negative effects of flooding do take longer to impact the plant tissues. Um, and that said, I have read or heard of people having winter wheat under waterlogged conditions for as up, up to three weeks and having um, not that many negative effects. Um, but yeah, I would definitely be concerned with the warm temperatures that we've had if, if uh, that plant material has been underwater for two weeks. And you know, if you can get out there, you know, wait out near rubber boots. You can dig up the plants and see if there's any, um, you know, root tissue that's alive. Um, or as soon as that water recedes from the soil, I'd go out or recedes from the field, go out and dig up some plants and see, see how it looks. Uh, so then, one other thing to mention is that if plants do survive that spring flooding, uh, you know, the prospects for normal development are quite good. Uh, but one thing to consider is soil fertility. So, you know, denitrification and leaching of nitrogen are a big concern in this, these flooded areas. Uh, so fertilizer should be applied as soon as possible and you may need to apply higher rates of fertilizer than you were intending to. Okay, and uh, so um, the plants that have been underwater since basically they haven't, they haven't not been underwater this year, would they have, broke their dormancy already or would they would that maybe help in saving them I would assume it would help in saving them because like so really the the crops the above zero temperatures um the plants are still like the plants are still respirating even though even even if they haven't broken like true dormancy so um, I think that that would definitely help, but the plant, those plants still do need oxygen, even if they um, have been underwater right since that snow melted. But I, th I do think that if they've been underwater right since snow melted and they haven't been had a lot of chance to grow, the, the prospects are better. Okay, and um, the one uh, question about, and this one will be uh, pertaining more to fall rye, uh, some producers had, uh, had planned or intended on maybe doing some grazing this spring on on some of this uh, uh, this, this these fields. Uh, what would your advice be, uh, being that it's late for them to graze? Um, like they were planning to graze early, like have more. Um, you know, I, I think that you know since the the calendar date is late, 
but really we're just starting to see fall rye and winter wheat fields green up and start growing like there, there really hasn't been a lot of growth so far so you know I would say it's you know probably quite similar to if you're going to be grazing at the end of April like with, with the amount of crop growth so I think you'd have to be cautious to not overgraze it and um, and you wouldn't want to be grazing if the soils were too too wet just in terms of like more damage to the plants by all the hoofs in the ground but um yeah you would definitely probably see some yield reductions but if you're careful not to overgraze it i wouldn't worry too much about the calendar date i would worry more about you know how the plant looks and what growth stage it's at okay great that's uh, good advice Han. Uh, I think uh, we have John on, so I think we'll come back to the panel after John's presentation, and let's go to uh, to John Hurd's presentation right now. Okay, John, remember you're on mute, so you can unmute yourself, and I've sent you the offer to present. You'll have to unmute yourself, John. All right, so... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm muted here. You okay, John, can you go... Can you go up to display settings in your top ribbon there, all the way to the top ribbon, and click that, please? I can do that. And then yeah. sw swap presenter view, please. And we're, there you go. It looks great. Okay. Oh wow, you're. Yeah, I I need a pen right now to uh, encourage me with my uh, uh, computer skills. So thank you, Lori. Uh, you're a good coach. Anyways, uh, thanks for the chance. I just want to. Scoot through, uh, Lionel gave me the opportunity because I'm getting lots of questions about fertilization right now. So uh, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction for more answers, but I wanna go through some of the uh, uh, the questions that I'm getting. Uh, so questions, you know, oh, one is why reconsider? Uh, I see three reasons. One is that yeah, a lot of farmers had the chance to put down what I could consider reasonably priced nitrogen in the fall. And now they're wondering, is that still there after all this wet weather? Number two, a lot of people in the droughted area had a lot of high fall nitrogen residual end levels, and that was in the nitrate form, ready to go. Uh, and so they might not have planned for much nitrogen in the spring, and they're wondering, is that still there? And the third one is those that have not yet put down fertilizer, uh, but they're seeing delayed seeding, into wet soils and maybe looking at are there ways that I can uh, uh, speed things up or facilitate things once I am ready to go. These are all covered in detail if you go to our current crop topics, uh, but you're gonna get the Coles note version here uh, live. Uh, so first of all, uh, you gotta know your nitrogen cycle to know what's going on. And uh, I should just say, if you don't, Hire someone that does know this for you. Have yourself a good agronomist because you got to know this stuff. So uh, the first thing I want to address is what's happened to fall nitrogen. And so if we look here and try to get this pointer working uh, uh, or the, the pen, uh, uh, we're looking at the, 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 the fall nitrogen. It means we're looking at what's happened with fall ammonia or urea that's been put down in the fall. and done properly most of that should still be in the ammonium form i uh, even now when it's applied to the ammonium form that positive charge means it's stuck on the clay or organic matter particles and that stuff is not lost we consider it stabilized when it's in that form in the soil and but it does not stay that way forever i have below here some great made in manitoba data that shows what controls that reaction Nitrification is a biological uh, microbial activity that's dependent on temperature. And work done in Manitoba shows that if that, in this case, banded urea was put down in the fall, if temperatures are 10 degrees C, it takes about 40 days for that banded urea to convert 100% to nitrate. If I put it down and it's five degrees, it takes twice as long. And of course, when you put your nitrogen down in the fall, uh, for example, at 10, it moves to five and then to one and then to, to zero or less for six months. So that's the strategy. Put the nitrogen on late when it's cool and you put it on that stage and it takes a long time for that uh, 
biological reaction to take place. At the other end, we get warm soils. This conversion takes place pretty quick. So in the spring, uh, we're going to look at the numbers and see if this is happening. Next slide, here are some of our Manitoba ag numbers. And note, right up until the end of April, most of our soils in Manitoba were snow covered, wet, and about zero degrees. So like nothing was happening. Uh, so that fall nitrogen put down, it was providing it was in ammonium form, was not doing anything, just waiting around. But things are getting revved up now. You can see those temperatures have gone up. And so uh, now those bugs will be working and starting to convert that ammonium to nitrate, uh, which is good for crop use, but it also moves it to a vulnerable form. Uh, next question is, uh, what about residual nitrogen? You can see last fall, we had a lot of residual nitrogen, uh, sometimes two to four times. The worse the drought, the more carryover. Uh, that was actually money in the bank. That was nitrogen that was available for this year's crop. But again, it's in the nitrate form, so it's vulnerable to losses. Um, looking at, at this chart here, uh, we can, uh, I'm going right to the nitrate part here. We're concerned about nitrate leaching. That is not a biological process. That can happen anytime you get water moving through the soil. And so if the ground was not frozen or, or uh, deeply frozen and water was moving through, for example, on uh, very sandy, coarse soils, anything that was in the nitrate form could be moving. It might have moved from super surface soils into the subsoil. Uh, hopefully staying within um, uh, rooting uh, depth, but again, it's it's moving further from the surface. Um, and uh, uh, note, so uh, that, 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 that occurs, doesn't need biological activity, that's simply a physical process. Uh, once it warms up in nitrification, we lose a little, a little bit of N2O, that's, that's uh, agronomically not insignificant, but environmentally, it's a, a potent greenhouse gas. And then we get denitrification once we're in the nitrate form. And just this made in Manitoba thumb rule uh, that on saturated soils or flooded soils in the spring, uh, when there's no oxygen in the soil, microbes, once they get revved up, here we're looking at five degrees C, we can lose two to four pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. Uh, this, one, this one is the, the real robber on our uh, clay soils uh, in the valley and in other areas, wherever water is going to be sitting uh, and oxygen levels depleted, we can lose uh, that uh, type of rate. So my 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 my, my quick summary here is: uh, Have we had lost? Have we lost nitrogen a day? Well, I'm saying from properly applied fall nitrogen, uh, no, because nitrification is just getting revved up now. So, uh, but you know, we could still have losses from now on. Point two, what about nit losing nitrate from denitrification? Same thing, biological process. So it's only getting revved up with warmer temperatures. So to date, it's probably been uh, slight losses. But if I've uh, had a, a nitrate, oh boy, we're moving ahead fast. Uh, uh, if we had nitrate, uh, there's possible losses on coarse textured soils, and those tend to be soils that people don't put a lot of fall nitrogen on. Uh, just a reminder here, I've been talking about, you know, what is properly placed nitrogen. Uh, here's some uh, people say ancient studies, but some uh, uh, baseline studies looking at broadcast nitrogen. And you can see that these green bars are fall applied versus the red is spring applied. And uh, the fall applied looks at the uplands or well-drained areas. There's much that there's less yield uh, if it's fall broadcast, but even more of a penalty. It really sucks if you put that fall broadcast nitrogen on poorly drained soil. If we go to some more recent studies that was fall banded urea, we can see that actually in the well-drained areas, the high areas, we can achieve uh, equal yield, sometimes even better than a spring banded. Uh, but again, in those low areas or those poorly drained areas, 
we still see this uh, uh, discounted increase. And again, it's because of greater potential losses where we have poor drainage. So what do you do if you suspect losses? Well, the first one is, I've spoken to, to someone already this morning about this. You may wish to do or have your agronomist do a re-soil sampling of not all your fields, certainly, but a few areas where you've had high nitrogen carryover. Uh, and I'm trying to do that. It's just too darn sticky out there, but I'm sure agronomists are trying to get out to do that, but it's a challenge. Uh, the, the strategy would be do it now before seeding and then adjust in rates later. Uh, if you put fall nitrogen down, this is really hard to do because the, the soil test will measure the nitrate, but fall nitrogen put down, some of it, will, most of it should still be in the ammonium form, some in the nitrate. If you've got bands, that further complicates things. Uh, it, I, I think you just frustrate yourself if you sample where there's been uh, fall nitrogen applied. The other option to do or with this is to use a nitrogen rich strip. Uh, we put down either a pass with more nitrogen at seeding uh, or broadcast them in there and then compare early season growth or color and top dress if warranted. And for example, here, here's uh, some fields that we've done in the past and uh, uh, farmers and agronomists have a good eye. Uh, you don't need uh, those, those, those tools on the bottom there to show you that that one side is is flagging or, or uh, pale compared to the enriched strip. This is what you do. If you don't see a difference uh, come June, uh, then your current rates are probably good to go. But if you're seeing a, a difference like this, uh, you need to top that up. And uh, again, a savvy agronomist uh, uh, can help you in this. What about if you haven't put your nitrogen down yet in the spring, you're concerned about wet soils, uh, there's a couple of things that happen with that. If you normally pre-plant banding, you could be making clods by going deep. Some will say it's onerous to pull the extra fertilizer while I'm seeding. Uh, let's look at some options. Uh, first, what's business as usual? In Manitoba, this is typically how wheat and canola farmers put down fertilizer. 4% uh, broadcast, but 52% of farmers band their nitrogen. Uh, much of that in the fall. 12% uh, sideband, 17% mid-row band, 13% seed place. Uh, I'm presuming business as usual means that those sideband, mid-row band, and seed place uh, operations are going to try to continue to do that as best they can. But we may see more shifting a little bit to some in-crop and some broadcast if, if they feel that those aren't going to uh, fit this year. Pre-plant banding warning, we saw this a couple of years ago with some wet springs. Uh, if you band deep, you could produce a cloddy seedbed uh, with, with poor stands. And so an option to that, that we had a couple of farmers doing in this area was seeding first and running over, uh, we can see that John Deere 1890 disc drill, uh, putting, putting down the urea after seeding and uh, produced a much better seedbed and stand than where traditional pre-plant banding had been done. So that's, that, that's an option. There's lots of broadcast uh, options out there. Lo lots of equipment, industry has lots of these things. It's usually not my plan A, but uh, years like this may become your plan B. Uh, warning on that, just the incorporation that may be required. We've seen this data recently, uh, and that is that shallow or poorly incorporated urea is still vulnerable to volatilization losses. And uh, it, it, based on some of this data shows that uh, you would need to till it quite deep to have 100% assurance. But nevertheless, uh, if you're harrowing it or vertical tilling it, it's probably inadequate and you may require or may warrant a urease inhibitor. Uh, uh, but that's got to do with the, the, the level uh, of incorporation that your tillage will do. Uh, this was a bit some older data that Manitoba Agriculture had in the fact sheets years ago. Again, here it shows that if it was incorporated an inch and a half deep, then the amount of urea lost was actually quite slight. But shallower than that, they did observe losses. Uh, recent work, I just put this up here to, to show that with urease inhibitors, uh, there's been 
uh, it, it's assisted us to do a better job. Uh, but here, here again, that's a surface in the red is the surface applied uh, urea products. And if I go below uh, this, what's in the green, those are the losses much lower where it's in soil banded. But those lines in between are UAN dribble and 28% uh, dribble is, is pretty good just physically uh, uh, that application uh, reduces uh, losses or exposure and that can be further increased by using uh, a urease inhibitor. So, so get some good options there to protect surface applied uh, nitrogen. I want to talk about split nitrogen applications where people might put a portion on out or before seeding, the remainder in crop, and the decision criteria for that, you know, if yield potential warrants that. I spoke to, I think, Jenneth may be on the line. I spoke to her this morning. I said, Jenneth, tell me how this works. Because uh, she's using, says, you know, sometimes our canola, it gets too wet. And if the crop's not looking very good, I short, you know, I reduce my split application rate because there's no use throwing good money after bad. And so that's what this gives you the option. And you can adjust rates also based on losses. If the crop is good, but you figure you've had more losses of nitrogen, it may allow you to put more on. And uh, a lot of farmers have the ability to do this with their, their sprayers. They can dribble in 28 in crop. Some data, this is from Indian Head, where they've been looking at this. Uh, I just want to point out their uh, gold standard, uh, they consider side-banded urea. And they have uh, three study, three years here with canola, two with wheat. Uh, so they tend to produce the top yields. If you look at what's in the yellow, this is where a couple of days prior to seeding, they applied surface broadcast urea, dribbled UAN, uh, or broadcast urea either with Agrotain or Super U. In general, those yields tended to be, oh, and the incorporation was simply the tillage or the seeding unit which was like a seed hawk or, or seed master type unit. So incomplete incorporation. The yields tended to be a bit less and certainly with wheat, the protein was less showing us that yes, uh, uh, not as good nitrogen efficiency. But if we look at the split, uh, which was half the nitrogen on in the side band, the half go remainder going on pre-bolting in canola, tillering and wheat, uh, same type of treatments. Those yields are a little better. And in fact, those yields in the wheat in 2017 uh, sometimes exceeded that of the side-banded urea. The protein's still a bit less, but I think this is uh, uh, an option that uh, shows uh, some promise of what can be done uh, by coming back, by, by having the combination. And we have some uh, very good Manitoba data from Amy Marge and Don Flayton, fairly recent, showing that when they withheld uh, about a third of the nitrogen until stem elongation or the emergence of the flag leaf, they actually achieved slightly better yields and better protein. But what makes that system work is that they had rain within five days of application to take it in the soil. So it was not stranded. So we have data showing that these split applications can work uh, well for us. Uh, there's several options. Generally, it's going to be a surface application. Uh, I put here, some people have, have diddled with in season, like, like side dressing, uh, no advantage, as good as but generally it'll be a, a, a top dresser dribbled application. Uh, here is some dribbled into uh, rosette stage canola. There's some burn there, but uh, uh, quite, quite acceptable. And, and again, again, one way to manage this by putting the remainder on in crop. There's many options in corn. You know, corn, corn is made for in season nitrogen. Uh, uh, and so there are several options for that. And the, the Manitoba corn growers at the time did a number of on-farm tests showing that, I don't know, there's 21 tests there. Only three times was there a difference from all up front. Uh, twice there was an advantage, and those would tend to be in wet years when you might have had losses. There was a yield disadvantage one year also, but that was when the farmer withheld the nitrogen too late to a V8 stage. 
So uh, again, for corn, good options. It looks like uh, there's uh, ample opportunity to do in-season applications. What about enhanced efficiency fertilizers? Uh, so I'm going to make a pitch for this in 2022 because where urease inhibitors to reduce flatilization may have a fit for these surface applications. If we lay urea or 28% on moist soil, it's followed by drying conditions without rainfall within three or four days, what we can have some high losses. It's, it's that moisture will dissolve the pellet right away. And as it dries off, uh, we can get those moving off. Or the other case would be shallow incorporation or poor sealing of uh, injection slots. We mentioned, we've observed that before too. There's no excuse for poor sealing of, of slots. So that's maybe a special pit for those. Nitrification inhibitors, generally not required in uh, a normal spring, but with continued wet conditions and high risk soils, uh, th there may be some uh, 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 without warranted. And ESN, uh, I really like this data. This is our, our friend from Montana, Clay Jones, put this together. He took the data that Cindy Grant and Ray Del Banco had accumulated and showed that in a normal or low moisture uh, spring or overwinter moisture, there, there, there's no advantage to using ESN. But we move into a high moisture, a lot of uh, overwinter moisture conditions. That's where the product tended to shine by uh, compensating or, or not having as much loss. So that's uh, a kind of pointing us as that as an option. And with that all in, just saying that uh, we're, we're very fortunate. The, the four R principles, uh, the rate, but particularly source, timing, and placement is what, what enables farmers to be agile and uh, uh, make some of these um, in season or on the move uh, alterations if required. Uh, I'll just mention one more thing about rate. I'm not talking about rate now, but uh, as we proceed, if, if seeding is continues to be delayed, farmers, of course, will want to look at what an impact this is having on yield potential. And as yield potential uh, uh, declines, then they may look at ratcheting back some of their planned nitrogen rates. Finished with that, Lionel, uh, you take it away. Hopefully I haven't used up much time. Uh, no, actually, Don, that was perfect. And I uh, got a couple questions for you. Uh, one, I think you maybe talked a bit about it, but uh, uh, have uh, you or have you been talking to anybody that's been doing uh, much soil sampling and any comments as to uh, where uh, where the nitrogen might be? Has it started to leach downwards or is it still in that zero to six? Wish I knew, Lionel. I'm still looking for a dry enough field to walk into in this area here. Uh, uh, we walked around in a muddy field on Friday uh, and, and did some hand sampling. Uh, that, that's how it's going to have to proceed for the next while. But I, I do not have reports yet. Uh, but I know there's a number of agronomists looking to do this very thing, is try to get out before seeding, uh, pull some samples, and uh, do this, a bit of a check just to see, you know, bit, bit, because frankly, uh, uh, usually nitrate in the soil in the fall is money in the bank. And, and, and we encourage farmers to adjust their rates, but we do need to know if it's still there. So. Uh, uh, I encourage you, if you have an agronomist, and if you have the opportunity, some sampling prior to planting may help you, uh, guide you as to whether you need to do any top-ups. Okay, and the other question that came in was, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the bugs working in the soil. Uh, with standing water for such a long period of time, is anything happening to uh, these bugs? Yep, uh, good, good, good question there. Uh, because for nitrification to occur, uh, that's the conversion of ammonium to nitrate. We actually need oxygen. You know, we go from NH4 to NO3. So we do need some oxygen for that process. If the soil is already saturated, that may 
uh, proceed slowly. But really the big thing is the soil temperatures have been so low that they uh, have inhibited uh, a lot of the uh, uh, activity. Now, once the soil bugs rev up uh, and if we are staying saturated, uh, those soils that are depleted of oxygen, that's when the denitrifying bugs will start using soil nitrate and depleting it at, at some of those rates I spoke about, two to four pounds per acre per day. Uh, so if you just want to keep track on the calendar for every day that field is uh, water standing on it or whatever. Uh, but right now, levels, the, the water staying on fields, the, the, those fields are still pretty cool. Uh, that soil is still pretty cool, and that's that's what's uh, uh, kind of keeping our our losses lower. But if they if we if those soils warm up and we we continue to have some standing water, uh, losses will mount. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, uh, Lori, if you want to turn the screen back to me, I'll uh, continue on with our panel and the questions. I guess I didn't give a, a fair introduction to uh, at the start uh, this uh, this morning, but I wanted to uh, welcome our panel back this year. Uh, we've already heard from a few of them, uh, Anne and Kim, uh, but uh, the rest of them have also volunteered or agreed to uh, come back again this year and and work with us throughout the growing season to uh, to help answer questions as we go. So I'd like to thank them all for uh, for agreeing. Um, and I'm just going to go to uh, okay. So our next question that came up uh, through the week and uh, is uh, um, with seeding getting later every day, looking at cutting some costs. What should I watch for or risk by not seed treating my cereal crops? Is there one crop that I should be more concerned over? Uh, soils will be fairly warm by the time I get out to the field. I'm imagining so. So. Uh, I, I sent that on and I was wondering, uh, I think uh, Dave is on, so I think uh, maybe Dave, you want to give a stab at that? Hi, Dave, we can't hear you. Um, if you're using uh, an external mic, you want to unplug it, plug it back in and just recognize the hardware. All right, Lionel, do you want to try the next one and we can come back to David? You bet. Okay. Uh, next one is going to go out to uh, Dennis Lang. I've uh, been hearing some rumbling from some producers about uh, planting peas and when it's time to start uh, thinking about changing my acres. Uh, this one producer said that peas uh, do uh, best seeded early and are best when they flower during cool part of the summer. What are your thoughts? Uh, and do you have a date that it is uh, too late to sow peas? So uh, uh, Dennis, uh, if you're on, can you take that one away? I will take that one away. And uh, the statement you made, yes, peas definitely do better when you can get them seed them in April. Um, so what I thought I would do is have a quick look at the crop insurance information going back a number of years because what's different this year is we don't have an early seeding. We have a very late seeding. And in the years when growers are able to seed in April versus uh, seeding that you know, third or fourth week of May, definitely there's a yield advantage for seeding in April. However, when I looked at a few of the uh, years where seeding was slightly delayed, like in 2009, for example, we had 66,000 acres. 3% uh, of the acres were seeded in April with a yield of 42 bushels an acre. Um, and when I look at the third week of May that year, um, we had 11% of the acres seeded with 50 bushels an acre. So again, the, the information about seeding early applies when you can get in the fields. However, we're not at that stage yet where we're getting in the fields. Um, I thought, well, let's look at a couple other years. Um, so I looked at 2020, for example, we had 136,000 acres. Uh, only 2% of the acres were seeded in April. Um, the yield there was 50, 57 bushels an acre. Uh, that third week of May, however, 22% of the acres are seeded then, and we were still looking at a 52, per, 52 bushel per acre yield. 
Uh, very similar trend in 2006 as well, um, where that uh, uh, acre seeded in April, 20% uh, of the acres, 43 bushels an acre, and that third week of uh, May, 13% of the acres, we're still looking at 42. So with that being said, even though we you know, are getting into May, we're at the 11th of May today, things, everything's later this year. So I would still feel comfortable planting peas into that you know, end of the third week of uh, of April or of May, I should say, and still see based on the season that we're having this year, because every year is going to be a little different. Um, I think we're still in good shape yet. Once you drop drop into that later, latter part of the fourth week, that's when the yields start to drop off. But uh, at this point here, I think we're still uh, we're still in shape yet. Where we can still plant until the end of the third week of uh, May here and still get some reasonable yields based on some of the information I've looked at. Plus, the season is so much later this year. Uh, than what we've had another year so okay uh thanks uh thanks dennis and uh i think what we'll do is we are going to go back to the question for david regarding seed treatment and uh, uh is there any way or should i be looking at cutting back and what are some of the issues i guess if i, I should be concerned about if i do uh not uh seed treat this year okay Thanks, Lionel. Sorry about the audio issues earlier. Well, when you sent me this heads up note earlier this week, uh, you said a lot of areas are still wet and uh, soil temperature is warming up. Um, the grower you were talking to was specifically concerned about oats and barley, um, wondering if you needed to spend extra money on treating. Um, crop will be planted into warm soils and up in a couple of days. So to that, I said, uh, I'm imagining that the grower is using farm saved seed. And if that's the case, uh, one thing you might be concerned about in barley particularly is a disease called loose smut. It is seed borne, but you will not see any evidence on the seed. Um, and you may not have noticed it in the field when you grew the crop last year or the year before. Um, that's because loose smut is not visible any longer by the time you're harvesting the crop. Um, so you could see as much as a tenfold increase in the amount of uh, loose smut by planting untreated uh, barley again. And I also cautioned that um, soil might be warm now, but have a look at the long range temperature forecast. Actually, right here in Carmen, the temperature was bouncing around between 10 and 15 degrees at planting depth. But uh, over the last day and a half, it has dropped under 10 degrees. So depending on the crop and the weather forecast ahead, um, soil temperature may be lower than you expect. It's probably worth uh, measuring it in the field. As you recall, last year, May was a very cool month and a lot of uh, seeds sat in the ground for a significant amount of time. Um, corn in particular doesn't like to uh, sit in, in dry soil or dry cool soils. Um, in a wetter soil, the pathogens that you'd be concerned about would include pythium. It's generally a minor root rot, but um, it does take hold in saturated or anaerobic soils. Um, that's something Anne was talking about earlier. And pythium uh, burns off the fine feeder roots, so it will really set back the crop early on. And um, Dane Fraze prepared a table last year, which um, was considering seeding in dry soils, uh, but it covers all conditions, dry and wet and cool and warm, and the root pathogens you're likely to run into so maybe I'll try and drop that into the chat. Would that work? And uh, we can have a look at it. Otherwise, I'll send it to you, Lionel, and you can distribute it to the participants. Is there anything great. else? Uh, no, that's great. That's uh, good comments and real good comment about uh, thinking forward and not just thinking as things are right now, because uh, as you say, the weather and soil temperatures can change pretty fast. So good comments there. Uh, gonna yeah. gonna uh, bring uh, Dennis back. I got a uh, question for him. If it gets to the end of May, should farms be shifting to a shorter season soybean? 
you know, I guess at this point, um, you'll have to really pay attention to your seeding deadlines, I guess, um, depending on which area you're in. Um, you know, crop insurance has that listed on the website, but if you're in the West, uh, May 30th is your full coverage. Um, and if uh, you've already picked an early season variety or a mid-season variety in that area, I probably wouldn't change in, in, the, um, in that area because those varieties are still suited to be planted right to the end of May. Um, if you were, let's say, in the Red River Valley, um, that would still hold true as well, unless you were growing with a really long season variety, then I might switch to something a little earlier. Um, one of the other comments I just wanted to make about the field peas that we talked about earlier, um, I was looking at the calendar here and what I would probably do is I wouldn't, you know, if you were still thinking of growing peas even that week of the 22nd of May, um, I would still probably put peas in that week yet because we still have another, you know, another part week left in May here yet, um, just because the season is so late. So I wouldn't start changing out of peas until probably the, you know, the last few days of May and then maybe move into something else then. So that's an additional comment about the peas. Great, thanks, Dennis. Uh, question for John Gavlowski about uh, our spring insects and what these wet cool conditions are gonna do and flooded areas. Uh, uh, any comments, uh, John? Uh, yeah, um, the, the one that most people have been asking about is actually grasshoppers. And because we have a lot of flooded ditches and field edges, um, the short answer is I don't expect a lot of mortality of grasshoppers from the recent uh, pooling water that you're seeing. The reason being, all our pest species of grasshoppers overwinter in the egg stage. The egg stage is very tolerant to excess moisture, so the eggs can survive sitting in water for days and still hatch. Uh, a colleague of mine um, once did an experiment where he took some grasshopper eggs and put them in a glass of water for a week and then poured the water out and the eggs all hatched. So the eggs are pretty resilient. If we had these same conditions um, about three weeks from now, not that we want that, but uh, excess pooling moisture in uh, early June when those eggs are hatching, would kill a lot of grasshoppers. That's when you get a lot of grasshopper mortality from uh, excess moisture. But uh, in April and early May, when they're in the egg stage, it's not likely to create a lot of grasshopper mortality. Cutworms, it'll depend on the species. Um, some species like dingy cutworm that overwinter as partially grown larvae may not fare so well in um, flooded conditions. Uh, species like redback cutworm that overwinter as eggs might uh, come through it a bit better. And flea beetles, they tend to be outside the field in areas that have a lot of trash and leaf litter, uh, usually areas with trees and shrubs. And um, how much flooding and mortality we get in that area, in those areas, is really uncertain. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't bank on there being a lot of flea beetle mortality. What might happen though, is if people are seeding their canola later this year into warmer soil, and if the, if the moisture condition is uh, good for quick germination and quick seedling growth, you may um, get less flea beetle um, feeding to the seedlings just because you've got that quicker germination and early uh, season growth. That might be, a if there is a silver lining to the later seeding, that might be one of them. Okay, good. Uh, that's good information, John, and uh, thanks for that answer. Okay. Um, I guess that's it for the questions for the panel today. Um, I'm going to go through a few slides here uh, just to give a heads up. Uh, want to let everybody know that this Friday, uh, May the 13th, is the deadline for the Livestock Feed and Transportation Drought Assistance Program. So if you're looking at putting in an application or still working on your application, definitely get it in by this Friday. Uh, there's also been a new program announced the, uh, through the EMO and Disaster Financial Relief. Uh, if you're in a situation where you have claims, uh, you can uh, look at uh, uh, that site to uh, put an application in there. 
Uh, like always, our ag adoption specialists, uh, there's myself, Terry Bess, plus uh, Earl Bergen, Mayor Farouk and Nicole Clausen. Uh, there's our information for contacting us, uh, our livestock extension specialists, Pam and Elizabeth and Sean, uh, their contact information as well. Our uh, MASC offices uh, in the province and uh, these uh, offices are fully stocked with all the uh, uh, the things I know Kim mentioned about uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, water testing kits as well. The, the uh, weed guides are in those offices as well. And just putting this up again because it's an important deadline. So uh, and um, the field crop production books I mentioned and if anybody's looking at a bulk order I did talk to Kim last week after I put this up and she said if you're in needing any more information to definitely contact her. Uh, Kim are you still on the line? Yeah yes I am. Okay I got a comment about the calculator uh, that you mm -hmm. put up for uh, uh, ammonium sulfate uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, is there somewhere where uh, I guess we can put it up on on the recorded version of this but somebody was saying that it should be put up in other places to make it more available so producers can find it and, and use it so uh, um, can I leave okay. the ball in your court there to maybe put it up on some other sites for us uh, yeah I can try I can maybe see too if yeah uh, maybe Lori and I can talk about the best way to do that but I will maybe get we that and see if we can on. get that live get yeah, we can maybe yeah. get it on our Twitter account, maybe too, if we could. Oh, maybe. Yeah, that might work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll see Great. what I can do. Good. It was a good comment, and I just didn't want to go out without missing that one. Sure. No. Yeah. Great comment. Okay. Good. And uh, I guess the last slide of the day. Uh, questions for uh, myself or Lori. There's our contact information, and our next crop talk will be on May the 18th. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I'd like to thank the presenters. And see you again uh, next week.